Were you, where were you living at that point? Uh, we lived in Naperville, Illinois. Uh, yeah, yeah, Illinois, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So now we're moving up. Now we come to here, Kansas City. Right. Well, let's just talk for a, a little bit about your um, relationship with MyJack, uh, because that happened during that time, didn't it? Yes. Um, really, my relationship with uh, MyJack started back in... Uh, about 1988, and uh, uh, there were some folks that, and again, my Jack was, you know, they build the, the rubber tired gantry cranes, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. and they were very much involved in intermodal. In fact, it was Larry Cena who used the very first crane that Jack Lanigan did, uh -huh. and really Santa Fe was ahead of the entire industry in mm -hmm. intermodalism but because of that. But um, anyway, because um, of Jack, uh, Mike Lanigan, uh, uh, he knew that I really liked Notre Dame football. Uh -huh. And uh, uh -huh. so... He also heard rumors from people associated with Intermodal at uh, Santa Fe that that were predicting that I was potentially going to be the president. Now, this was before I even thought I was ever going to be the president. So he started taking me to Notre Dame football games, uh -huh. and he actually he engaged Johnny Latner to be kind of a salesperson for him, and I'd go to games with Johnny Latner and get to be personal friends with him, great guy, mm -hmm. fantastic guy. And so anyway, that's how I got to, to know the the uh, people at, at uh, my Jack. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and that was another thing. Uh, when I was uh, at uh, Vice President of Operations, uh, uh, we actually, uh, we were one of the first groups to uh, contract out uh, the operation of intermodal terminals. Mm -hmm. uh, and we did it out in south of uh, Denver at a facility we had there. And, you know, the uh, uh, unions were not real happy about that. Mm -hmm. uh, right. But uh, right. th that's how uh, ITS got started uh, that uh, mm -hmm. ran terminals and eventually became a huge company that... that uh, did outsourcing for virtually all the railroads in North America of handling their intermodal business. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's how we got to know each other. I see. So then when you formed your company, so when you left uh, Santa Fe and took a year off, but then you renewed your uh, relationship with them around well, the time? Well, I never really did you know, lose the relationship with mm -hmm. them. I was always very close to the Lanigans. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You know, we're almost, you know, like, family yeah. and uh, uh, so anyway we kept a relationship but I started this uh, company up Haverty Corp <clears throat> and they actually uh, became an investor in in the uh, company mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. and so we ended up uh, we invested in a uh, what was part of the old uh, South Orient uh, railroad ran through uh, Texas down to the border of uh, Mexico, and then mm -hmm. they wanted me to uh, go down and look at Argentina mm -hmm. uh, because they had invested in a port down there, and they wanted me to stop in Panama and look at the railroad there, which I did not want to do. But mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I ended up doing that in April or March of 1994, and that's and ultimately we were we set up a proposal for Haverty Corp to run that operation and my Jack would be an investor. And then things just kind of went silent. So then when I took over the job at Kansas City Southern in 1995, Mike Lanigan called me and said, you know, hey, what about Panama? And I said, hey, let's take the plan I wrote up with Haverty Corp Instead of Haverty Corp and my Jack, it'll now be KCS and my Jack, and that's how we got invested in the wow. Panama Canal Railway. Wow! And and that was probably uh, considered at that time, you know, going back to your 
your sort of moniker as Maverick, that that must have really been considered out there yeah. uh, a high risk uh, uh, yeah, it was, uh, decision. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, nobody could understand that. And I remember some people going down, I think I've told you this story before, with the Smithsonian mm -hmm. and a couple of board members that were in the short line business well, I went by and looked at what we were doing with the track in Panama, putting in concrete ties, 136-pound welded rail to run at 70 miles an hour, and it's a 47-mile stretch across mm -hmm. the Isthmus of Panama. Mm -hmm. They said, how could that guy be that stupid to, to uh, do this? Well, I had this idea that we were going to run this like a production line, and guess who our biggest customer was? Maersk. Huh. And in fact, I went over to uh, Copenhagen, and that's what I was doing over there, and tried to get them to invest in the railroad. Mm -hmm. And uh, they they just couldn't understand what it was that that I was trying to do. But I was telling them instead of running through the canal, taking mm -hmm. 24 hours to queue up and nine hours to go through, you know, if you've got these. Units, if you're going down the, if you're going down the west coast or down the east coast, drop them off, and we'll just shuttle them back and forth. Mm -hmm. Well, they couldn't figure that out. But guess who became our biggest customer? Maersk. And and guess okay. what the operating ratio of the Panama Canal at at one time was below fifty. It was like forty eight. And uh, it, it was unbelievable. Forty-eight meaning uh, Th that was the operating I mean, ratio. ratio. So, so that so meant that, that meant that the uh, th the uh, contribution margins on the traffic was uh, fifty to fifty-two percent. And today, uh, the wow. big emphasis is on the operating ratio, which that's another subject I think mm -hmm. overemphasis. But uh, uh, you know, they, they all want to get down into the 60s or the 50s, but, you know, we had that. Mm -hmm. And we just operated again with, you know, yeah. uh, uh, small crews. And and then, you know, the, 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 we didn't have labor unions, and the guys would mm -hmm. get off the trains, then they'd go and help unload the units, uh -huh. you know. Yeah. So, and, and so anyway, we put all this money in up front with the idea that it would be you put all the capital expenditures up front. We had a 50-year concession. That railroad literally would last for 50 years with minimum maintenance. Mm -hmm. But everybody just said, man, it's crazy and never going to work and uh -huh. Uh -huh. so on. And then we got Amtrak uh, retired locomotives and mm -hmm. painted them in the Kansas City Southern uh, paint scheme. We called the railroad the Panama Canal yeah. Railway Company instead of Panama, so mm -hmm. Panama Railway, so people could understand where it operated. Yeah. So Kansas City Southern was a real, was probably the smallest, right? Of yeah, the, not of the, probably of the class ones. It was the smallest. So you had to be like the the um, what was it? Remember when Avis was we try harder or what? what well, I don't know what your slogan was, but uh, you had to really be a kind of a scrappy. Uh, um, uh, entity within the within the whole industry, right? Uh, yeah, and, and if you go back in the history of Kansas City Southern, it's it's always been somewhat of a uh, scrappy uh, entity. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, back to the days of uh, Arthur Stilwell, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, uh, he did some of the things that some of the bigger railroads uh, did not like. Uh, in pricing and and things like that, and uh, and over the years, it's it's always been scrappy. Uh, but um, when I went to work uh, there in May uh, 1995, May 15, 1995, the railroad had actually been up for sale uh, in 1993 and 1994, mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, Holding Company also owned the Janus Fund and the Burger Fund and other financial assets, and uh, the board had decided uh, to get rid of the railroad. Now, when I had Haverty Corp uh, Company, I was down talking to Landon Rowland at uh, Kansas City Southern, trying to convince him, don't sell it, expand into Mexico. That's, that's the next growth area 
in North America, but they said that they were going to sell the railroad. In fact, they tried to hire me to help them sell it, and I said, I'm not into selling railroads. I like to run them. But, uh-huh. So anyway, uh, uh, they did, did not get it sold, and the chairman, Paul Henson, who used to be uh, the CEO and chairman of Sprint Corporation, mm-hmm. uh, and then he was uh, chairman of uh, Kansas City Southern, came up to see me in February 1995, and, and they didn't get the railroad sold uh, because the two interested parties were Burlington Northern and Santa Fe. And, that, and I still will tell you that that was the reason that those two got merged together because there was a very much a concern by Santa Fe that, that BN was going to buy the Kansas City Southern uh-huh. and that Santa Fe might be left out. So Santa Fe then merged and, uh, so uh, mm-hmm. KCS was uh, kind of out there on its own. Mm-hmm. So here had been for sale for almost two years. There hadn't been hardly any capital put into it, nothing, information technology. So when I came down in May of 1995, uh, virtually uh, people were writing the obituary of Kansas City Southern that it was mm-hmm. not going to survive, and it was only a matter of time before... Uh, it would be uh, sucked up by mm-hmm. much larger carriers. So what made you so interested in uh, in heading up a railroad that everybody was was uh, so so pessimistic about? Uh, because I did believe, and I had been down there trying to tell them, don't sell it, think about expanding into uh, into Mexico, mm-hmm. and, and I truly mm-hmm. believe that. So when Paul Henson came up in February, I did not know that he was going to offer me the job. I thought he was just going to come up to ask me what I thought about the potential of Mexico. He said, you know, we'd like to have you run the company. And I said, well, the only way I would do that is if the board would be willing to consider expanding into Mexico. And he said, we we will. And uh, Mm -hmm. so anyway, so that's why I accepted it. And I remember telling my wife, uh, uh, I said, you know, this is small railroad, not nearly what I went through Santa Fe for two years, which, you know, she was, I would travel constantly and work, you know, lots of hours. And I said, this will be a lot easier. Uh, Not quite. It was uh, actually, and I've actually told a few people that I said, if I'd known what I was going to get into, I probably wouldn't have taken the job. But, you know, as I look back on it, I mean, it's been a very gratifying experience. And, oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, taking that on, uh, now NAFTA had passed in 91, 92? N- 94. 94. Yeah, it went, went into effect oh. in 1994. Right, uh, but but uh, George H. W. Bush had it's, the negotiation started on yes the, the, the negotiations yeah. and that's how I got involved in it in ninety one when I was mm-hmm. still at Santa Fe I had gone to Acapulco uh, to a uh, worldwide CEO conference down there and got to meet uh, the negotiators, uh, from Canada, the United States and Mexico, mm-hmm. who gave the presentation in 1991. And that's when I said, whoa, this thing is going to be something. And, and I actually wanted Santa Fe to, uh, get interested in this. Uh, but Southern Pacific had had a very difficult situation in Mexico, uh, back in the 60s when their investment down there was expropriated. uh, And uh, Mm -hmm. so, you know, there was not a great feeling about us going down there, although personally I thought that we should do that. And, Mm -hmm. of course, then I left, uh, you know, shortly thereafter. And and I really did believe in Mexico Mm -hmm. and NAFTA, and I still do. Mm -hmm. Do So um, the the decision to go into Mexico was that, um, was it a phased approach, or how did you how did you work uh, uh, that through to to finally get into the country, or how to sort of cross the border? Well, one of the things that uh, happened is after I left 
Santa Fe, uh, J.B. Hunt Transport had actually wanted to get into the trucking business mm -hmm. down in Mexico, mm -hmm. and J.B. asked me uh, clear back in uh, 1991 uh, to accompany him on a trip to Mexico as he was looking for a partner uh, down in uh, in uh, Mexico. So we went to El Paso, we went to Monterey, and then we went down to uh, Mexico City, and uh, that's where I uh, uh, met uh, Pepe uh, Serrano, who owned the largest uh, uh, ocean carrier and transportation company, actually, in all of Latin America. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, anyway, I, when I came down in 93 and 94 to talk to uh, Lan and Rolo at Kansas City uh, Southern, I had told him about Pepe uh, Serrano. Uh, and uh, so, uh, anyway, uh, as a backup, uh, Landon was always looking at, you know, what if this doesn't happen or this doesn't happen. So he actually sent a fellow named Mike McLean down into Mexico and to look at the Mexican railroad that was going to be privatized. Um, that decision was made in hmm. in ninety five and and or actually they knew by ninety four it was going to be privatized. So he went down. And he actually met. Uh, Pepe Serrano, uh, who I had been down there with. And in fact, Pepe Serrano had sent a message through J.B. Hunt to me that mm -hmm. if the railroad is privatized, this was when I was running Haverty Corp., mm -hmm. uh, would, would Haverty be interested in coming down and running the railroad down in Mexico? And, and I said no, that I didn't want to do that. Uh -huh. but, uh, but I wanted to hook up with a railroad in the United States and so that's uh, that's how it came about. But literally, the mm. the second day that uh, I was uh, in office, uh, Pepe Serrano sent a consulting team up to see me about making an investment in Mexico. And believe me, I had so much going on. Right. I said, "Hey, I lo love Mexico. Want to invest in it, and so on." I first got to learn about what Kansas City Southern is. I got to learn the business here. And so on. So we'll talk about this. But uh, so I got down here uh, in May, and then you know just a short time later, uh, I think it was June that the uh, well, in fact, that the month I got here, the UPC and NW merger mm -hmm. uh, was approved, which. Kansas City Southern lost a lot of green as a result of that. Mm -hmm. And then three months later, the BN Santa Fe merger uh, was approved. And then a couple of months after that, the uh, uh, UPSP uh, merger uh, was, or was announced. And it would end up that if that merger was approved, that 90% of all rail traffic west of the Mississippi River was going to be handled by those the, those two, and so everybody again said, Kansas City Southern was gone. So I knew uh, that we had to step up the pace and uh, and look at investing in Mexico. And it so happened uh, that uh, Serrano's company owned the Texas Mexican Railroad, and uh, mm -hmm. we did not want to have to go before the uh, surface that. Interstate Commerce Commission at that time later became Surface Transportation Board. Uh, so we took a 49% position in, in that. Mm -hmm. And this was with all the mergers taking place, and we were the laughing stock of the industry. You know, here, Kansas City Southern runs to Beaumont. It's got a 500 mile gap between Beaumont and Corpus Christi. And, uh, you know, that, but we had a plan, and our plan was that. That the what then became the Surface Transportation Board would uh, would cause the uh, UPSP to spin off some of its lines, and uh -huh. we would pick up a line that would connect down there, uh -huh. which that never happened. But we did get trackage rights, uh -huh. so we did have access then to get to Laredo. So we became a legitimate bidder in uh -huh. on a Mexican concession. Was the uh, and was there was competition for that, <laughs> for that uh, Mexican business? Uh, uh, Who was your competition, I guess? Uh, Union Pacific totally uh, 
almost dominated. Uh, you know, they, they have they have eight different interchange mm-hmm. points between the United States and uh, Mexico, and uh, Laredo is the biggest. Uh, but uh, Union Pacific totally uh, almost dominated all of the traffic uh, into and out of Mexico, and and there were going to be three concessions that were going to come up, and the first was the Northeast concession that ran from Laredo to Monterey to Mexico City mm-hmm. to Veracruz and then over to um, uh, Lazaro Cardenas, Port of Lazaro Cardenas. And it was uh, given that Union Pacific was going to be, was going to get that. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. Uh, but we, uh, we ended up with that. You know, we read so much now about NAFTA and about trade and, and what specifically about NAFTA made it a game changer in your, in your opinion? What, what, what was a provision that, that really made it uh, feasible or attractive for you to make this kind of investment? Well, it, it uh, knocked down, you know, a lot of the tariffs. And, you know, I've told this story before, but, you know, uh, Ross Perot always talked about, you know, with NAFTA you were going to have this giant sucking sound mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and so on and and i've said you know the the only uh, giant sucking sound i've seen is is mexico buying products and sucking them down into mexico and in fact Kansas city southern handles more southbound traffic to mexico than we handle out of mexico mm. and you mm. know a lot of people don't understand that and 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 a lot of these People that uh, grow grain in Minnesota and Iowa, Nebraska, Illinois, Missouri, Kansas, Oklahoma, and so on—they're now shipping products down in into Mexico. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it's uh, been a tremendous amount of business. They're buying our products, mm-hmm. and you know, they they are producing products down there that come into the United States. But as far as I'm concerned, NAFTA did exactly what it was supposed to do. And if you look at the trade between Canada, the United States, and and the United States and Mexico prior to NAFTA, and then you come back, you know, years later and look at it, I mean, you know, the growth has just been absolutely phenomenal. Do you think that uh, after 20 years, 25 years, well, 20 years, that that these kinds of... um, Agreements should be revisited or, uh, or yes. fine-tuned, or yes. Or, so you're, yeah, you're, you know, I, I think that's true with any kind of agreement mm-hmm. that you're in. You know, right. I mean, when yeah. it's been in effect for twenty years, you know, you, you're going to find out, you know, what what we do wrong mm-hmm. and what are the weaknesses. Mm-hmm. You know, so let's yeah. go back in mm-hmm. and let's tweak it and do what we need to do. Especially, but uh, you don't. You right. don't scrap it. Yeah. Well, especially in the last 20 years, and, and this is something that I'd be interested in your, you know, we've, we're living in the digital age now. You know, you, you, you remember the, the uh, cards yeah. from I the 60s, cards. but now it's since the, the, the uh, I guess, the uh, silicon and transistors and, and uh, chips uh, have changed every, everything. Um, and so even that alone in the last 20 years has changed communications and information technology. And how has that affected uh, your business? Railroad business? Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, uh, certainly uh, it has helped improve it. You know, I mean, with signal systems, mm-hmm. uh, uh, PTC that's being uh, put in and... Uh, uh, the way that you can uh, exchange information and uh, different things like that. It's, it's just, uh, uh, you know, technology has really helped. The thing I say about the railroad industry, though, is, you know, you look at how long the railroad industry has been around in the United States and how many times mm-hmm. people have written it off mm-hmm. saying, well, it's going to die. And, you know, there have been lots of things that, that were not good, in the past, you had robber barons, and then you had poor management, and you had too many unions, and you had at one time the railroad nationalized, and 
the threat of nationalization mm -hmm. and all that stuff. But when you get down to it, the steel wheel on the steel rail is still the most efficient means of ground transportation that there is. Mm -hmm. So when you take that ground transportation over the long haul and you take all the technology mm -hmm. that is available to figure out how you can move all the, this traffic and so on, like FedEx does, like UPS does, and so on. Uh, I think the railroads are going to be around for a lot longer. Yeah. I went to a uh, convention two years ago in Indianapolis of the Railway Supply Institute. They have this yeah. amazing, and you've probably been there, I'm sure, and these suppliers, uh, most of whom are, are relatively small companies, that I mean, you've got GE that was, I don't know, right. GE was, make, was, make, was making locomotives at one point. I don't know if they're still, uh, they're, they're spinning that off, but yeah, yeah. but the, um, the supply chain of just what it takes to, to make this industry, uh, work is quite amazing. And I'm thinking about what you would say to somebody, uh, considering a career in railroading now. Uh, what would you advise them? You know, what would, uh, you know what? What would be the uh, the path that they might follow to be, you know, following your in your footsteps? Well, I think that uh, clearly they have to be innovative. Uh, but in the final analysis, and you know, I'm, I'm old school. Uh, you know, you have you have to run a tight ship, mm -hmm. and. Again, you have to you have to deliver the product on time at uh, a reasonable price, mm -hmm. and and I mean that's just yeah. common economic logic, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so when you get into this business, you need to understand, you know, what is technology going to be able to do in the future? How can it help you plan the supply chain and mm -hmm. work with other organizations and so on to move the products. But in the final analysis, you still got to move it from A to Z mm -hmm. at a reasonable price. And uh, and you got to do it uh, and as expedited as you possibly can. I want to talk a little bit about people. You've mentioned a lot of people who have influenced you. And I had some uh, people who we haven't mentioned. Uh, Paul Tellier. Yeah. Uh, what what was your relationship with him? How did you get to know him and work with him? Um, Paul actually uh, first uh, came down uh, to see me uh, around 1998, and uh, he uh, was interested in a, uh, and I can say this now, it's been mm -hmm. a long time ago, uh, he was interested in a consolidation uh, that uh, might uh, involve Kansas City Southern. And, you know, mm -hmm. the ironic thing is that Kansas City Southern had been for sale, you know, just a few years earlier. Mm -hmm. And uh, all the railroads looked at it and come to the conclusion that it just, you know, wasn't the right thing. In fact, uh, Kansas City Southern had bought what we refer to as the Meridian Speedway between Shreveport and Meridian that is actually the best route uh, between uh, the southeast and the southwest in anticipation that Norfolk Southern might be interested uh -huh. in the Kansas City Southern. But anyway, none of the railroads had had been in, in, you know, wanted to buy this. and But then Paul took over and really modernized uh, the uh, Canadian National, you know, and it went from being a nationalized railroad to a privately traded railroad. And what Paul did is just absolutely amazing. And uh, he was innovative, entrepreneurial, mm -hmm. did a just tremendous number of things. But he came down to visit me and and he thought about, uh, he said, you know, when you think about maybe we can put these companies together, you know, you, you believe in NAFTA and, you know, it'd go from Mexico to the United States to Canada and I said, yeah, we, we do. Uh, but I said, you know, Paul, we don't even really connect with you. You mm -hmm. know, we're not. And he told me, he said, uh, I'm going to buy the Illinois Central. Now, he told me this a long time before he actually bought it. 
But uh, he said, well, so we will connect. You know, we'll connect at Springfield, Illinois, and mm-hmm. we'll connect at Meridian, uh, Mississippi. And uh, so, you know, and I, I never ever told anybody. And I never went out and bought any IC stock or uh, anything. I didn't, right. You know, I just I kept it quiet. But anyway, so, you know, he kind of really wanted to do something. And, uh-huh. and I told him, I said, you know, uh, you have to to let us develop Mexico and see what we can do there and create value for our shareholders. Because, you know, basically, you know, with our stock price back in those days, and you can go back and take a look at it, mm-hmm. uh, um, you know, I mean, Kansas City Southern was still a holding company, but, you know, and it had it done pretty well, but... Um, you know, we still had a lot to do to create value. Mm-hmm. And anyway, he and I, though, developed a relationship and we ended up, we didn't merge, but we ended up entering into a marketing agreement to where they would move traffic from Canada to Mexico and then move traffic between uh, Mexico and Canada via our, mm-hmm. our lines, primarily going through Meridian. So... Uh, uh-huh. That we and 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 Paul and I and our teams uh, would meet uh, literally every quarter, and we'd go back and measure how much business we were doing, mm-hmm. what the opportunities were, and so on. Mm-hmm. But he was a great. Well, he's going to be a, an inductee uh, to the Hall of Fame. He is an inductee, I should say. Yeah, he he yeah. he actually, I think he's uh, he's already in. I think. Uh, yeah. he, and, he and I and one other fellow I think the only maybe living members uh-huh. Uh, yeah. uh-huh. and, and living uh, inductees mm-hmm. um, something you just mentioned um, and I I want to talk about people uh, in uh, who we we sort of mentioned in passing but something you just mentioned about shareholders and and so much of the uh, reading about business and one of the criticisms of, of corporations is that they, they are forced into short-term thinking because of the shareholder uh, expectations. Can you comment on that at all, how that affected your management and your decision-making uh, in, in this industry? Well, I'll tell you, there's a uh, tremendous amount of uh, pressure from Wall Street. Uh, there always has been, there always will be. Mm-hmm. You know, and mm-hmm. their number one objective is the uh, return on investment. But sometimes you, you know, you have to look beyond quarter to quarter to quarter. You know, you've got to look at the long term. Mm-hmm. And I would say that I've always been a long term player. And uh, so we made decisions for the long term. And, you know, if you go back and look at the results, mm-hmm. it turned right. out just fine in the long term. Mm-hmm. But, you know, from quarter to quarter, we didn't always meet the expectations. And, you know, and uh, my response to that is, you know, you need to understand what we're trying to accomplish. And if if you really don't like that, you don't want to do it, then you ought to own some other stock besides uh, us. That's uh, the way I feel about it. 